Welcome to today's talk and book signing by Professor Doug Allen on his newly published Gandhi After 9-11, Creative Nonviolence and Sustainability. My name is Devin Grayson Wallace, and I am a member of the Board of Peace Action Maine, a local community group committed to educating around disarmament and creative responses to conflict. I also want to say a big thank you to Stan Scott for organizing this event today because it would not have happened without his instrumental efforts in bringing down Professor Doug Allen. Uh, and also recognize Stan's, Ooh, thank you, Stan. Stan's efforts as our uh, former chair of the board for many years. Um, and finally, last but not least, thank you very much to Professor Doug Allen and his wife, Ilsa, for being here today for this talk. Professor Allen is a professor of philosophy at the University of Maine. Um, and he is among the founders of the Maine Peace Action Committee, which is not to be confused with Peace Action Maine. It is a student-run group out of the University of Maine. And we have some of their most recent newsletters up here too, if you're interested in checking that out. Um, it's been running for 45 years. Just, wow. um, Professor Allen was also a founding member of the Peace and Justice Center of Eastern Maine, located in Bangor. So we are very glad to have him here to share his wisdom with us today. Yeah, thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, I didn't know whether doing it on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> also on a holiday weekend uh, that uh, whether unfortunately I do still teach this is my last 46th and last year of teaching at the University of Maine and I'm doing my final teaching this fall so I was could not come during the week we have a group called the Maine Peace Action Committee in fact, it was founded in 1974 when I joined the faculty at the University of Maine. And, uh, and we've, it's one of the oldest, mainly student groups in the United States. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, um, I uh, spoke here in this room uh, in May 20. 17, it was actually the day of commencement at USM. And we had a program, and this was, this was May 2017. So people, this was after the November election. People were in a state of shock. I knew longtime peace and justice people who had trouble getting out of bed. They were so traumatized. And they couldn't believe that, is this the world in which we're living? You know, it just seemed so uh, insane. Uh, that So actually, the talk that I gave in here as, uh, was, how would Mahatma Gandhi have looked at Trump and this age of Trump in which we're living? So, um, and I very much enjoyed, the, uh, as I expected with Peace Action Maine, people came who are highly self-motivated, who have a lot of life experience, and also who often know a lot. And so I know today also we'll get great questions <laughs> and some good disagreements, <laughs> and which I always welcome. So I'm looking forward to the question period, the discussion period. So let me just say a little bit, uh, give you a very brief introduction relevant to uh, the book in terms of my background. And I'll just say very uh, quickly, when I was very young, in fact, uh, 1963, 1964, I was only 21 and 22 years old, and I was very fortunate to uh, have a year's formative experience in India on a special Fulbright. We had to teach one upper level English course, and then we were free to do whatever we want, wanted. And I was so fortunate to be assigned to Banaras, the holy city of the Hindus on the Ganges River, 
Also, just near where the Buddha delivered his first sermon at Sarnath. I had all of this formative experience when I was very young, open to new culture, music, art, religion, philosophy. And I was able to do PhD work in what was, at that time, probably the number one department of philosophy in India. And so a lot of famous philosophers. My main uh, mentor there was someone who was the head of all India philosophy. He was a very famous scholar. So that was very formative. But we never studied Gandhi, because he was not considered a philosopher. Right? But Gandhi was in the air. People would say, in the name of the Mahatma, they'd wear their Gandhi khadi vest. They'd wear their Gandhi caps. Most of it was total hypocrisy. <laughs> all the politicians, all the judges, all the, you know, they'd say, in the name of the Mahatma and so forth. And then they would go live their lives in totally anti-Gandhian ways. But I did not go, for different reasons, I didn't go back to India until I, my sabbatical in 1986. I did many other things. Since then, uh, I've been back to India many, many times. I've spent more than four years in India. And, uh, and uh, now I go on sabbaticals for five, six months. Most recently, with my sabbatical in 2015, 2016, where I did some of this research for the book. And, um, and now I go back, and it's more lecturing, research, collaborative work. I have so many dear friends in India and colleagues and people who I work with both in uh, peace and justice activism as well as uh, research. So uh, I had not real, Gandhi was important in my life because I was, for example, I was very involved in the civil rights movement in the South. And very soon you learned you could, Martin Luther King Jr. was like our key, uh, formative influence, and you realized you could not understand King without understanding Gandhi, as King himself would always say. And then in the anti-war movement, the Vietnam Indochina anti-war movement, we we're always trying to use Gandhi in different ways, how we could create, you know, amidst all that violence, uh, uh, how we could create some room, some space for nonviolence, nonviolent alternatives. And that was a long part of my life. I spent about 10 years in the anti-apartheid movement with South Africa, and then working in the feminist movement, environmental movement. So many different areas where Gandhi was such an important formative influence. But I did not look at Gandhi in scholarly ways uh, until the 1990s. So I first started publishing on Gandhi's philosophy uh, in 1994. And so since then, I've had many different interests, but I'd say probably the strongest in terms of my work has been uh, the philosophy and practice of Mahatma Gandhi. And so and this is maybe the fourth or fifth book, the most recent one, that's Gandhi informed. So in, uh, okay, so then what I, uh, let me give you a little background on this, that um, if you look at the title of the book, it can be very misleading, right? Um, Gandhi after 9-11, uh, creative nonviolence non and sustainability. Creative nonviolence, sustainability, that was me. But Gandhi, even though I had published, I released one article after 9-11 in the leading Gandhi journal in India, Gandhi after 9-11 in 2001, uh, I realized uh, this was not my title. In fact, uh, I decided first to have it published with Oxford University Press. I worked with them in India. Because I said, you know, the most readers probably around Gandhi are going to be in India, South Asia, and also, they can publish a cheap edition. Even though they first only published it here in hardback, the edition in India costs like 
And I said, OK. And then it, would be it was published in January in India, and then here in the US in June. OK. The people in India, the editors at Oxford, picked the title, Gandhi After 9-11. And that made me nervous, because I said, you know, this sounds so American-centric. Uh -huh. <laughs> We're going to de define everything in the world in terms of you know, what happened on 9-11. Like, that is the most. And so I thought, you know, this is, uh, this is a part of the history of colonialism, imperialism, globalization. We are the world. We define the world. So they said no. They said, actually, Gandhi after 9-11, not only is it catchy, but it, it, it actually it is a world significant event. Mm -hmm. We all know. So then I thought about it. And I just want to say, you can interpret that title in several ways. One way is just literally, which to me is the least interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, we had this event on 9-11. 2001, Gandhi was born in uh, October 2nd, uh, 1869. And that October 2nd is the United Nations International Day of Nonviolence, which they chose because it was Gandhi's birth birthday, even though they never gave him a Nobel Peace Prize because Churchill, British, and so forth were always so opposed to that. Uh, and he died, he was assassinated, right, mm -hmm. on January 30th, um, 1948, okay? So 2001, we're talking about, yes, Gandhi after 9-11, Gandhi lived before 9-11. In fact, he lived 50 years before 9-11. So there is the literal historical temporal dimension. Gandhi lived at a certain period before 9-11. Right? Now, what is Gandhi's relevance after 9-11? Is Gandhi still relevant today? Right? OK, so that's one dimension. But then I realized, there, as I put in the book, there are other dimensions, actually, that are much more complex and, to me, meaningful, such as what does 9-11 represent symbolically in terms, of language, in terms of a certain narrative that we give? As we often say, our leaders say, everything is different after 9-11. War on terrorism, we are living now in a different post-9-11 world. Okay, what does that mean? So just to say something that's come up in some of my presentations and discussions where it's interesting. And in the book, I also talk about 2611, 2008, terrorism in India, in Mumbai, in Bombay. That was a big thing. In fact, I was there a few weeks later. They said, what would Gandhi have to say about here we had four days of people being slaughtered? in the train station, in the hotels, and the, yeah. so, okay. But I've been to India so many times. India's had a lot of terrorism. Mm -hmm. This wasn't the first time. Even where bombs, you'd be walking there, bombs would go off, people, okay. But then I thought, when you think about it, what it means symbolically, that narrative, I said, <clears throat> for example, if you're an indigenous person, if you're a Native American, so many I work on source. They say, we've had our 9-11s mm -hmm. going back at least to Columbus. Mm -hmm. And all these years, we've had our 9-11s. Sure. Let us tell you, not about a couple of thousand people die. Let's talk about the extinction, the genocide of entire tribes, the, geno the destruction of our place, our land, our language, our culture, right? Every level. We're, well, suppose you're an African-American. You say, well, we've had our 9-11s going back more than 400 years. Yeah, we can talk about what it was to be forcibly removed 
from your land in Africa, put on slave ships where incredible number of people died in the voyage. They never made it across, and they're just thrown in the ocean. You come here, and you're separated from family. You're on on. We, we know that narrative, what it is. Uh, so I, and when you look at it that way, you see the title is actually more interesting to me and what I'll present than it first literally seems. OK, so the approach I'm going to give you, and has to be selective, is that, um, that Gandhi actually has a lot to say today. It's valuable. But only if we selectively are able to read, interpret, apply, reapply, contextualize what he has to say that's relevant today in new ways. So what I want to avoid is, on the one hand, let's say a lot of people who just worship Gandhi as the Mahatma, right? Larger than life, with a halo. And, uh, and I know so many Gandhians like that. The Mahatma has all of the answers. He gave us the perfect blueprint for how we can achieve peace, harmony, love, uh, overcoming violence, overcoming war, overcoming destruction of nature. Gandhi gave us all the answers, but he was too good for this world. He was ahead of his time. If only we would listen to Gandhi, this would be like a paradise. But we don't, right? Uh, to me, that approach to Gandhi, well, I'm an incredible admirer of Gandhi, makes him totally irrelevant. Right, uh, for dealing with the real contextual world in which all of us are living. The other extreme is people who are uh, total critics of Gandhi, whether they've read him or not. But they also have this image of this essentialized Gandhi, kind of stereotypes. But in their view, he ha has these absolute values he has this, like, the absolute blueprint, which actually has no relevance to the world in which we're living. And in fact, um, and if you look, they'll say, at Gandhi, the, his actual life, he was very dogmatic about this. And he acted in a horrible way towards his wife and his children and people in his ashram, followers and others. No, Gandhi doesn't have the answers. And in fact, if we say you have to follow Gandhi's way, that's an obstacle to us really being able to even work for real peace and justice and nonviolence and harmony and so in this world. Okay. I want to avoid those two extremes, you'll see. And I want to show how Gandhi is very significant, but only if we approach him in a selective way and appropriate in new creative ways what is of value in Gandhi, okay? So let me, what I'll present to you is uh, two major concepts or principles in Gandhi's philosophy and practice, which in thousands and thousands of pages, Gandhi says these are the two most important principles, concepts in his whole philosophy, right? And how it's applied. Gandhi's mainly concerned about practice, not abstract philosophy. Philosophy only has value if it's action-oriented and it's put into practice, okay? So, and, I, and everything else in Gandhi, because in Gandhi's view, it's a holistic view, Everything is interconnected. So all the other key concepts in Gandhi, many of which you know, you, can re you must necessarily relate to these two central concepts. Okay? So here are the two I'll present. Because I think, and I, what I'm trying to do is challenge all of you, okay? And see in different ways. Uh, many who may feel, oh yeah, we agree with Gandhi and 
Uh, we know what that is. Those are the things we believe in. So the first one, as you know, the main concept that Gandhi's associated with is ahimsa, which we should translate as nonviolence. Technically, in the Sanskrit, himsa means to harm, terms like to harm, to injure. So am in Sanskrit means not. So this is not harming, not injure, injuring. Some of you have seen this in different philosophies, terms like benevolent harmlessness, not harming. Usually in English, we most translate it as nonviolence. So I'll use the term nonviolence here. Now, what I found is most people, and, I, and I'm sure everyone here, but most people will tell you, most will tell you, you know, peace is better than war. Love is better than hate. All right? Kindness is better than selfishness. Justice is better than injustice. Well, they usually say that. Then they usually qualify it. They say, we wish were it so. We wish the world was like that. But unfortunately, you have to live in a real world. And sometimes war is necessary for peace. Violence is necessary for nonviolence. Sometimes cruelty or selfishness, or even ego-driven greed, it's necessary to get on in this world. Okay, So they qualify. Sometimes, for example, you know, for thousands of years, we've had religious and philosophical views that war is horrible. But you know, there are some circumstances where we can have just war. Sometimes just, war is just, and they try to give criteria for that. Okay, so here's the challenge. Most people who tell me initially that they believe uh, in nonviolence, peace, and that they're against violence, uh, what they usually restrict that to is kind of overt physical violence. In other words, what they mean, overt physical violence, what they mean is, I'm against torture. I'm against rape. I'm against certain domestic violence. I'm against certain kinds of bullying. Right? I'm against, I'm against all these tweets and things that come out of the White House every day. You know, I have no trouble. You know, I'm against that. Um, okay. Now, what the challenge is, what Gandhi is going to say, he agrees with you, Gandhi is against overt physical violence. He is, throughout his life, he saw that. There were many assassination attempts on Gandhi. He finally was killed at the end by, at least at the end, it was, it was an act of overt physical violence, right? Committed by Nataram Gatsi, and you can analyze the whole thing, but he was shot, he was killed. Okay, so for Gandhi, Gandhi is against overt physical violence, but Gandhi says that's a very small part of violence. <coughs> it's less than 10% of violence. So what Gandhi is saying is most people who say they're nonviolent, they actually are very violent. They're either directly violent, they profit from that violence, <coughs> or at least they're complicit with the violence, what King called, for example, the uh, white moderate who kind of knows certain things are wrong but doesn't get involved and hence perpetuates the racism in the society. So Gandhi is saying, okay, so what does that mean if Gandhi's challenging us and saying that most of us who believe in nonviolence and peace and so on, we're actually very violent. So in my work, I've done this two ways over the years and in this book. Two key ways I've tried to analyze Gandhi's analysis, how Gandhi deepens and broadens our understanding of violence and nonviolence. First one is Gandhi says violence and nonviolence are multidimensional. 
multidimensional. So yes, you have overt physical violence, but you also have psychological violence. You have inner violence. For Gandhi, hate is violence. Hate is violence. Even if it doesn't manifest itself in an overt physical way, but if you are filled with hatred, you're a violent person. And that will express itself in all kinds of different ways, how you relate to yourself and to others. So, in addition to psychological inner violence, Gandhi says, we have linguistic violence. For Gandhi, it is so important how that child, ages two, three, four, engages in language acquisition through which they experience the world and how they express themselves. Language can be very violent, right? Okay, so that's, uh, because of time, I won't go into the specifics, but you could see that. I mean, for example, teachers, I'm not just talking about the obvious violent language you see. Being in a classroom, a teacher can use language in a very violent way. For example, language can be used to shame, to embarrass, to control students, right? And that does violence. That's a method of control and so forth, hierarchical control. Gandhi spends the most time on economic violence. If you wouldn't think someone like Gandhi, so moral, so spiritual, spends the most time. For Gandhi, economic violence is equivalent to exploitation. Exploitation is violence. Gandhi often says poverty can be the worst form of violence. So for Gandhi, economically, uh, what that means is we have asymmetrical power relations between the haves and the have-nots. Some people have the economic power. They own and control the means of production. They own and control the land the factories, the oil, the water, raw material. They own and control the means of transportation. They own and control the media. All these things, well, they are able to establish these asymmetrical relations with the have-nots, people who don't possess all of that economic power. Slaves, serfs, working peasants, working class, and so forth. For Gandhi, that is structurally violent. Gandhi says you cannot have ec gross economic inequality and have nonviolence. He says it's impossible. Gandhi's a radical egalitarian. Okay? Then you, Gandhi talks about cultural violence, political violence, state violence, of course, military violence. Gandhi spends a lot of time on religious violence. For Gandhi, Gandhi's religious, spiritual in a sense, but for Gandhi, most hierarchical, institutionalized, tradi traditional religions are extremely violent. Extremely violent. And then Gandhi talks, of course, about educational violence. Gandhi talks at great length about environmental violence. It's so relevant today in the world in which we're living. Okay, so what Gandhi is saying is, here you have all these different dimensions of violence, how we're socialized, and they all interact with each other. They reinforce each other. So that finally you're socialized in a way that you accept, make certain assumptions about human nature, about the way the world is, about who you are, about how you relate to others that are very violent, okay? So that's one way. Second way Gandhi says is, he talks about the structural violence of the status quo. That's business as usual. What's normal? You just, Gandhi says our political system, when it is functioning smoothly, without disruption, Without protest, without resistance, without civil disobedience, without boycotts, without strikes, the system is very violent, structurally violent. He says our political system, our economic system, when it's functioning smoothly, is ex in fact, you want to disrupt it. 
because as it's functioning smoothly, in terms of the status quo, it's extremely violent. It's producing and reproducing all of these violent relations and structures. So Gandhi extends this to every level. The way, for example, we regard nature, the dominant paradigms we've had in the post-enlightenment period up till recently. Like I said, we need a paradigm shift. Because that view, for example, that nature is just some valueless object for you, that uh, we are going to use science and technology to control and dominate it. It's very violent. It's a very violent view. Okay, so the part I'm bringing out here is Gandhi says when you combine the multidimensionality of violence and then nonviolence in each of these things that I said, and the structural violence of the status quo, this just burst open how we usually look at violence and nonviolence. It just totally deepens and broadens our understanding of ourselves, our relation to others, our relation to the cosmos, and so forth. So that's first thing. And, and, and Gandhi, of course, is the most influential uh, proponent of nonviolence of the modern world. As we, as we know. Okay. But you see, so you'll see in a second, he's also very controversial in all of this. Right? Okay. And you may even ask things like that, like, Joe, you know, how would Gandhi deal with the terrorists? How would Gandhi deal, right? Uh, um, how would Gandhi deal with the people who are just destroying the planet? How would Gandhi deal with the per person who's going into the school and shooting up people? Who isn't interested in nonviolent dialogue? They don't want to sit there and talk to you, uh, okay, about multidimensional violence and structural violence, okay? So we may get into some of that. Then the other key concept that Gandhi has is called satya, which is usually translated as truth. Now, what's interesting about that, and that's basically his view of reality. What Gandhi says is, uh, and his term for truth satya is unusual. That's not the usual Sanskrit term for truth. So what he's getting at is this, the word sat. Sat is one of the key Sanskrit terms. It's in all the scriptures, all the philosophies. Sat means being, what exists, what is real. Is uh, what is real, okay? Asat is non-existence. What does what is not real? So what uh, Gandhi is trying to get at by using sat, and he uses this interchangeably. He says um, for truth, he says truth is being, truth is what is real. Sometimes he says truth is God. Sometimes he says truth is the soul or self, meaning the universal spiritual self, Atman, or other versions, even sometimes his truth is love, uses many different terms like this, okay? And Satya, it's active, it's a kind of truth force, truth force, which he uses interchangeably with soul force, love force, many, many terms like that, okay. Now, what does he mean by this, by, uh, by Satya? So he has this basic idea right, that uh, basic or orientation that in fact focuses on unity, oneness. In some sense, there's the interconnectedness. It's a holistic view, organic view. The interconnectedness of all of reality and what unites us, in some sense, is more fundamental than what divides us. There's an underlying fundamental unity, oneness, but it's a unity with respect to differences. So where Gandhi is different from some traditional Hinduism and other approaches. You don't just eclipse differences or be kind of hegemonic or power relations. No. There's this underlying fundamental unity and oneness, but with respect to differences, there are many different paths to the truth. 
For Gandhi, it's very dangerous if you say, I have the absolute truth, I have the only truth, because it, then it means that all the other positions are false. They don't have the truth. And he thinks throughout history that leads so easily to violence. The other, if I have the truth, the other, in fact, is irrational, immoral, uh, uncivilized, superstitious, idol worshiping, evil. And now the other is a threat. How do we protect the truth that we have? And this leads to intolerance, violence, war, all the different things that Gandhi's opposing. OK, so how does Gandhi do this now? It's very, end up, very complex. And Gandhi, Gandhi looks simple. He's not so simple. Gandhi always says simple living, which he does believe in. But you'll see, simple living is not easy to live. And, <laughs> And it's very complicated. We may get into that. In fact, he wants to say simple living is not reducing everything to lowering your standard of living. He's going to simple living is high living. That's what he's going to argue. In fact, it's simple living allows you, in fact, to develop your human potential and live at a much higher level than we live today in the world. So what Gandhi is, here's how Gandhi does this, which is quite on the one hand, Gandhi makes a big distinction between absolute truth and relative truth. A lot of people misunderstand this, because if you read Gandhi's autobiography and many passages, it looks like he's an absolutist. He just says, I believe in the absolute truth of nonviolence, talks about with a capital N, of love, compassion, I believe, he said, sometimes he calls it God, or other Brahman, Atman, or whatever, Allah, or whatever different forms it takes. And, uh, and I believe in the absolute truth of pure morality, pure ethics. He even says, I believe in the absolute truth of pure religion with a capital R, which is not any institutionalized religion, but it's this pure spirituality. Okay, so if you look at that, and Gandhi does believe in absolutes, uh, but it's easy to make him into this absolutist, very rigid, uncompromising. If you actually look at Gandhi, Gandhi is saying, uh, and we all will see, have experienced this absolute truth. We could get into this guy. We all have that. Uh, but what Gandhi says is that most he has glimpses, glimpses, temporary imperfect glimpses of absolute truth. Because 90% of Gandhi, Gandhi's emphasis is on relative truth and relative untruth. We are all flesh and blood human beings. We're embodied, we're contextualized, you're living in a real world that you're living in, economically, socially, politically, genetically, all kinds of, you know, uh, that's the relative world in which you're living. You may believe in certain absolute truths, which are Gandhi, they're very important as these absolute ideals. But then you're functioning in this world. For example, to give you the easiest example, nonviolence. Gandhi says every human being living in this world is violent. That's part of our human condition. What we can try to do is to avoid intentional violence as much as possible. We can try to minimize the violence, but just how we live. We're human beings. We say things that are hurtful. We say things that we regret. We, Gandhi says things like just our everyday eating food, building shelters. He says, even opening the windows to let the sun in, you're killing sentient beings. You're killing life. That's why, so Gandhi is, his uh, project here, his philosophy and practice is, how can I move from one relative truth, an untruth, to greater relative truth? That's the idea. 
Like for example, I give you an example with diet. How can I? And it's very hard. He's experimenting his whole life with these things. And often they're failed experiments. He feels he failed. He's experimenting with diet. How can I live a kind of vegetarian diet? How far can I push it? How can I, strongly influenced by Jainism and so forth, if I'm building a road or structure and I'm cutting down trees, or even picking up stones that are there, there's life under that stone that you're coming. How can you have a more harmonious relationship so that you minimize the relative uh, violence and other untruth and maximize right, uh, truthful living that allows you to move from one relative truth, hopefully, to greater relative truth, closer to the ideal, but never as a human being in this world, you're an embodied human being, you never fully experience permanently, eternally, the relative truth. The reason this is important as opposed to a lot of spiritual, moral approaches, Gandhi is an activist who takes very seriously the fact that we live in a world of untruth, of injustice. The idea is not simply to liberate yourself from this world and experience moksha, experience mukti, nirvana, for years and so forth. No, for Gandhi, he doesn't want to renounce this world in terms of his philosophy of truth there. It's how you engage in the world, right? So that uh, you, in fact, at the same time that you're creating a more truthful world, a more nonviolent world, that's how you realize yourself, how you become a more developed human being. Okay, so what Gandhi does in this regard is he often uses truth and nonviolence interchangeably. The, you know, he has his famous means-ends analysis he's famous for. Gandhi thinks, in fact, the modern world, one of the problems with modern civilization, what's dominated our thinking since medieval approach, is this doctrine, the ends justify the means. And you could use any means necessary to achieve the, whatever the end is, right? And he thinks that's it, the head of the center of our political systems, modern, our economic systems, our you know, total way of living. For Gandhi, no. So part of the means uh, relating it to the ends, Gandhi says, okay, the usual thing is nonviolent means are necessary in order to achieve truth. And it's the usual, right? You can't use violence in order to achieve truth. In fact, if you use violence, that will shape the ends. You can't use terrorism to overcome terrorism. Otherwise, you'll live, as we say, in endless vicious cycles of terrorism. You can't use hatred in order to achieve love. You can't, so, okay, so that is usually nonviolence, ahimsa, is the means to realize truth. Right? Reality, being, God, whatever. But Gandhi actually reverses it too. He says truth and nonviolence are two sides of the same coin. They're, they're just two different ways of looking at the same reality. So Gandhi says truth is also the means for realizing nonviolence. In other words, true, you can focus just in, in that way itself. Uh, you, in living truthfully, right? Then, in fact, this is a way of becoming more nonviolent. Right? In other words, when I recognize the truth, for example, of the basic unity and oneness of all humankind, and I live according to that, I will become a more nonviolent person. Okay, as opposed to, let's say, just to give you an easy example, can I take? Suppose. I have a view, suppose I'm a white supremacist, you know, uh, I suppose it's every, it's all around us. Suppose you're a virulent white supremacist. Well, you then start with the view uh, in a racist way that the other, the person who is not white, is not like you. In fact, as a fundamental category of your way of being, 
your values, your worldview, it's based on this dichotomy between us, the white supremacist, and the other who is not white and who is not like us and is dangerous, violent, untrustworthy, or one, you know, and on and on. Okay? So what Gandhi, so Gandhi here is saying that the two, truth and nonviolence, in fact, necessarily are part of the same whole. Now, I can just uh, mention that two things in that regard. One is when most people look at things this way, and they're looking, say, at truth, Gandhi, Satya, what they want to emphasize is this means and causal kind of chain. It's like a law of karma or a Buddhist doctrine of dependent origination, some that you're, some of you are familiar with. In other words, what they're focusing on, they're saying, look, Gandhi is, pro Gandhi is primarily a moralist. Gandhi, the way I interpret it, Gandhi's main concern, he has many concerns, Gandhi's main concern is that you live a life that's virtuous, that you have character, <laughs> that you, I mean, that's what Gandhi's major concern is around all these other things, okay? So, and he's pragmatic. Gandhi always says he's an idealist, but he says he's a pragmatic idealist. He's an action-oriented, pragmatic idealist. You can't tell whether something is truthful unless you put it into practice and you see what the results are. So Gandhi says, in this regard, Gandhi says, okay, in this cause and effect way, if you act untruthfully, basic causes, conditions, this will create effects, untruthful effects. Right? Whether it's the example I gave of racism, or let's say you have now to look at the Holocaust or anti-Semitism, if that's a fundamental category, the Jew is other, who then is devalued, is inhuman, and so on. We see you become trapped then in those endless cycles untruthful cycles, okay? So, and which for Gandhi also pragmatically are unsustainable. It's unsustainable, causally unsustainable. And Gandhi today would say, that's why people love to apply it to climate change, growing concentration of wealth and power in the hands of the less than 1%, globalization, the creation now of hundreds and millions of displaced people who are, and on and on, all things we could talk about. Uh, Guy says it's unsustainable. Untruthful living, in fact, just causally in terms of the effect, it creates us in these endless cycles of violence, of hate, of terror, of war, of injustice, of exploitation, of environmental destruction and so forth that just are unsustainable. <coughs> so that is one level where you can see what Gandhi's saying about truth. But the part that's usually ignored that I said, Gandhi also has a certain ontological position. There are a lot of people who are Gandhians who call themselves pragmatic Gandhians, and they say, look, we don't have to think about this ontological or metaphysical or worldview. Nonviolence is just effective. Try it. Let's not get into any of this. You can use it to overthrow dictators. You can use it to deal with angry prisoners so they won't be so hostile. You can, and people today all over the world, in the US and in India, and so on, Gandhian management. We can use Gandhi. If you're a corporate CEO, you have all these alienated workers and so on. You can use Gandhian techniques so that the workers will be happier. Or we can target the customer, each of you. Gandhi says you should regard the customer with dignity. And we'll target each of you as an individual. In all, through all this uh, you know, stuff you're exposed to every day, uh, through advertising, media, all this surveillance type stuff that's going on, so so that, but the whole point is then, so you'll consume more, so you'll be a loyal customer, so you will, no, 
For Gandhi, you could see the effects. No, consuming more is an absolute disaster in terms of Gandhi's view of truth. In fact, unless you change, that is untruthful living. And you're using Gandhian techniques, which are basically untruthful, and they're going to produce untruthful results. So if you look at Gandhi's metaphysics or his view of reality, Gandhi says this, look, he has this view of the inter-organic view, of the interrelatedness. It's a dynamic, open-ended view. All reality is connected. You're connected from the individual level, the social level, economic, political, all this cosmic level, all this, all this. We're all interconnected. So what Gandhi is saying is that when we act untruthfully, not only does it have disastrous consequences, but in fact, as far as that, we are violating the nature of reality. Because truth is a force, it's an active force. Truth is that force, that truth force, that love force, that soul force, that all these terms he uses, it's that force that brings us together in inter connected sense of community, shared community. You can only do this when you de-emphasize your ego, when you realize, in fact, the other is part of who you are, part of your identity. And in fact, when you, in fact, act in selfless ways to meet the needs of others, especially others who are most suffering, have the least freedom, who are the most exploited, when you do that, it's not altruism or charity. That's the way you develop and become a human being. Okay, so, so what Gandhi is saying is that uh, when you act in a truthful way or in a nonviolent way, it's not just that it has good effects or positive effects, but in fact, this is a way of activating in a sense of being, of reality. And in fact, uh, it is a way that I'll, the reason it's sustainable is because, in fact, it's consistent with the nature, the holistic nature, the interconnectedness of all of reality. So what Gandhi is saying, is the last part of that, is he's saying, OK, uh, it's very practical on all levels in this sense. This is a way from everything to how you can develop, live more truthfully, more peacefully, more compassionately, in touch with in your own individual life. Okay. In terms of what he calls these oceanic cent centric waves that each spread out and are all interconnected, it's a way, for example, to have good friends, to have good family relations. It's a way of having good sense of community. It's a way of having uh, good classrooms. It's a way of having a good nation. It's a way of having a good world. Not because these are platitudes, but in fact, this is the way that we actually tap into what is real in terms of the nature of reality. Instead of when you see when we're acting in ways that violate the nature of reality, you see the disastrous consequences, which not only are unfortunate, but right now they're economically unsustainable, environmentally unsustainable, in terms of war and violence unsustainable, in terms on and on at every level. So the last thing I'll say, and then we'll open up, is uh, in the approach I'm giving you, which could be a little deceptive based, I always qualify it. Because what I'm saying is Gandhi does not have the perfect blueprint. I agree with Martin Luther King, Einstein, and so many other people who said, you only ignore Gandhi at your greatest peril. And so Gandhi, for me, is so relevant to the world in which we live, but he doesn't have all the answers. In fact, Gandhi, in fact, we approach Gandhi often now, in Gandhi 150, the 150th anniversary of Gandhi's birth this year, we approach him in ways that he never even approached himself. Gandhi was so self-critical about himself. 
His autobiography is called My Experiments with Truth. Gandhi writes thousands of pages of his failed experiments with truth. Some of them he even calls Himalayan blunders. He didn't just get it wrong. I and mean, that's how seriously it was wrong. Gandhi late in his life, which is the most remarkable career for me of Gandhi, he was so depressed at the end. Even though the question is, how did he keep going in such a heroic way? He, was so, he looked around. This was after India partition, yeah. right? Oh, and for said, here are mil at least a million people were slaughtered. Oh. And he's looking, and he's looking at the incredible thousands of women and children who were raped. And he's looking at the Hindu-Muslim communal violence. He had worked for 50, 60 years on that. Mm -hmm. And the way the untouchables, the Dalits, were being treated. This, he had worked for 50, 60 years on that. Mm -hmm. And patriarchy and all of this. And, and Gandhi says, no one's listening. Mm -hmm. No one's listening. Mm -hmm. OK? So what I want to point out is Gandhi was human. Some of what Gandhi said was never, you know, it was his repressed personality, his upbringing. For example, Gandhi always opposed birth control. You know? Now, you could be a Gandhian and say, well, that's something we have to change, uh, or which is what I do. But um, Gandhi himself, most of the stuff he said earlier that was really very objectionable about truth, nonviolence, morality. He revised it. He changed it. He learned. Okay? He but evolved. He evolved. But the point is this. We live in a post-9-11 world. In many ways, the contextual world we live in is similar, but it's also very diff different from the world in which Gandhi lived. Right? Very different. For example, Gandhi was concerned about atomic weapons. He was still alive after Hiroshima, Nagasaki. He wrote about that. All this alarm that's true. But the world in which we live today, the militarism, the extent to which our budget goes for the military, how the military is part of this globalized industrial, military, militaristic complex, all these ways are ways. Gandhi gives an analysis, but we're living in a world now or the role of social media and how that functions. The, so what I'm saying is we ourselves can use, selectively use what is the value of Gandhi. And there's so much of value in Gandhi, right? That, uh, from which we can be inspired and we can learn. But we have to look at it selectively and then appropriate how we reread that, how we reinterpret it, we appropriate it. We necessarily filter all of this through the contextual world in which we're living, which in many ways can be quite different. And then, uh, in addition, the last thing is, there are a lot of non-Gandhian positions that are very insightful. Give you an example, I, you know, I gave you, like climate change. Gandhi is really good on climate change. But we've had a lot of amazing environmental thinkers and activists in the last 20, 30, 40 years. Some of them that were, some like Arnie Ness, who coined deep ecology, he was totally influenced by Gandhi, even wrote a book on Gandhi. But there are a lot of environmentalists who do great work who don't know one word about Gandhi, and or feminism. Gandhi, again, it's very mixed, but Gandhi, has some brilliant insights about women and women's freedom and equality. They're really advanced where we are in the United States or any place else in the world today. But there are many other feminist thinkers who were not, you know, Gandhi was not a formative influence, and they have brilliant insights. Okay? So my approach is when we bring together a kind of selectively reformulated, recontextualized Gandhian perspective and non-Gandhian perspectives, at least in my approach, what happens is certain new things emerge. There are new ways of understanding, right, that can help us, in fact, to how we can live our own lives in a more meaningful, creative way, and part of transforming a world in which we live that's more humane and that 
allows us not only to flourish, but also to survive.